Good afternoon, everyone. In 2021, MIGS shouldn't be an acronym that you have to rack your brain to remember what it stands for. Minimally invasive glaucoma surgery options are exploding. Optometrists play a key role in diagnosing glaucoma, in the management of medical and non-surgical glaucoma, and then making the appropriate referral for glaucoma surgery when it's indicated. Collaboration in the perioperative care of minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries is well within the optometric ability and should be in our arena. Glaucoma is defined as a progressive optic neuropathy that causes characteristic visual field loss as well as damage to the optic nerve or cupping. In glaucoma, we have a lot of tools for diagnosing glaucoma. We have interocular pressure, or IOP, pachymetry, corneal hysteresis, gonioscopy, visual fields, OCTs. Those are just the most common ones. We also have adjunctive diagnostics like an ERG or an APD measurement. In glaucoma, diagnostic approaches far outnumber treatment approaches. Treatment in glaucoma revolves around lowering the interocular pressure. That's still the mainstay of treatment. When we look at our standard treatment options for glaucoma, we know that this is a treatable disease. And when I'm managing glaucoma, whether it's a new patient that I'm seeing for the first time, or it's a patient that I've managed for years, I like to remind patients that our standard way of treating glaucoma is we're gonna to try to lower your interocular pressure. And there's three main ways that we can do this. We can do this with glaucoma medications in the form of drops and now drug delivery. We can do a laser glaucoma procedure, or we can do an interocular glaucoma surgery. And interocular glaucoma surgeries have a really big spectrum from minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries, as well as incisional glaucoma surgeries being tube shunts and trabeculectomies. Unfortunately, a majority of our glaucoma treatment options have at least one drawback, and this is why minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries is considered one of the bigger breakthroughs in glaucoma in many, many years. The prevalence and cost of glaucoma has led to minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries, and let's define MIGS. MIGS are procedures that take an ab interno approach, meaning the surgeon views the inside of the eye and then is doing surgery from inside out with a gonioprism. These are procedures that try to be maximally efficacious. So we try to get good efficacy, but providing a very safe approach that prioritizes visual acuity and visual recovery. The goal is to intervene earlier in the disease course, treating the glaucoma with a safe approach and lowering the medication burden. You can see in this picture to the bottom, this is our MIGS devices in the stenting options in comparison to the size of a penny. On the far left, we have eye stent inject, followed by eye stent, followed by eye stent supra, a suprachoroidal device currently not available, followed by Zen gel stent, a subconjunctival stent, that's the green stent. Next to it is Cypass, this is commercially not available, and then our newest stenting device with Hydrus. The first key to really being a professional in minimally invasive glaucoma surgery is understanding the state of the crystalline lens. Remember that cataract surgery alone lowers IOP. It's a nice adjunctive treatment, and many of our MIGS procedures couple very nicely with cataract surgery to either enhance aqueous outflow or decreasing aqueous production. And so a patient who has a cataract as well as mild to moderate glaucoma, my philosophy is really to try to treat these patients in the angle or the canal first. We wanna to try to maintain that anatomy and physiology for these patients when we can. A second big key to cataract surgery plus MIGS is many of our stenting options are approved to be done in conjunction with cataract surgery. This is how these procedures are approved on label with FDA, and this matters for insurance. Patients with narrowed angles, patients who are high hyperopes, they have progressing glaucoma despite good and maximal medical care, really need FACO. This is a nice treatment for these patients. Patients who are pseudophagic, MIGS is not only in conjunction with cataract surgery. Patients who are pseudophagic can still have minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. For our stenting options, this would now be considered off-label. It's safe. We do it in our practice. It's just insurance can be a hurdle here. So in these patients, most commonly, we're doing a, a tissue removal or destructive procedure like a goniotomy. We can do a canaloplasty where we're kind of opening up Schlem's canal. We also have subconjunctival procedures, which are best covered for these kind of pseudophagic patients. A second big key to minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries is feeling comfortable and confident with a gonioscopy lens. 
a large proportion of these surgeries are done in the angle. And so we have to be able to use a mirrored lens to view the angle to make sure there's no pathology, there's no areas of blockage or sinecae preoperatively. Postoperatively, for many of these procedures, we can't directly view the angle that's been operated on or the area that's operated on without a gonioscopy mirror. And so you want to be able to see that that goniotomy was successful in removing trabecular meshwork or the stent is in the right position. And so gonioscopy is crucial in the perioperative care of MIGS. This is really the money slide for MIGS for me. When I see this slide, I think of Cuba Gooding Jr. and Jerry Maguire saying, show me the money. This is the money slide right here. This chart does a really nice job of breaking down our MIGS options based on outflow pathway. And then the final table on the far right is our cilioablative procedures trying to turn down aqueous production. Again, all of these procedures can be done in conjunction with cataract surgery. That's important for FDA labeling and getting them reimbursed by insurance. An asterisk next to a procedure denotes a procedure that's currently in FDA clinical trials or is not approved by the FDA. And then SIPASS has been voluntarily withdrawn by the company as well as the FDA. And so today we're gonna to really define three outflow pathways for MIGS. First, we have trabecular meshwork in Schlem's canal. We can stent the trabecular meshwork to try to get fluid into Schlem's canal with eye stent, eye stent inject and hydrus. We can try to dilate Schlem's canal to get more fluid to the aqueous collector channels with GAT, Visco 360 and ABIC with which are both canaloplasties, and then omni, which is a combo procedure. We can cut out or unroof the trabecular meshwork with Kahook dual blade, or we can ablate that tissue with trabectome. Our second aqueous outflow pathway is the supracroidal or supraciliary space. This is similar to uveoscleral outflow in our prostaglandins. We're trying to drain fluid into a potential space in between the choroid and sclera. Unfortunately, we don't have a procedure that's approved and available right now. And then finally, the subconjunctival space. This is commercially available with Zengel stent. This is a bleb-based procedure, and it's bypassing the conventional outflow pathway. And then finally, our cilioablative procedures. This is trying to use a heat laser to scar down the ciliary body in the processes to try to decrease aqueous production. And we can sometimes use our cilioablative procedures in conjunction with some of these other procedures. And so let's go into some cases here. Let's have a case-based discussion on MIGS. This is our first patient. Patient MA is a 67-year-old Caucasian male who presents for a glaucoma evaluation. He's a construction worker and exercise enthusiast. Refraction, he's moderately myopic with, a, again, a moderate amount of astigmatism in both eyes. Corrects to 20-20 in the right eye, 20-30 in the left. Applanation tonometry of 18 in the right eye, 21 in the left, but his Tmax is higher at 22 and 26. Average corneal pachymetry, he does have visually significant cataracts in both eyes and his gonioscopy is open with mild pigmentation in all angles. MA currently is taking Travitan Z in his left eye only, and he does have a strong family history of glaucoma. And so let's go into our ancillary glaucoma testing here, first with an optic nerve head OCT. The right eye is shown on your left. For the right eye, I said this is overall a pretty normal RNFL printout here. For an OCT of the retinal nerve fiber layer, I'd urge you to look at the Tisnik curve, that bumpy kind of mountainous curve shown in the middle. Be careful with stoplight grading. Green is good, yellow means slow down, red means stop. We can get caught diagnosing red disease in a patient who is maybe a young age or doesn't fit the normative database, a patient with a myopic nerve. Remember to really hone in on that RNFL thickness plot there. On the left eye, I said there's some inferior and inferior nasal retinal nerve fiber layer thinning on that left eye. Now, corresponding structure to function here, looking at a Humphrey visual field, right eye shown on your right. When I look at a visual field, the first thing I do is look in the top left corner to look at the reliability indices. Is this a printout and a test that I can gain value from, or is this just garbage in, garbage out? On this right eye, I said this is overall a very reliable test with no definite glaucomatous defects. We have some inferior scatter there. On the left eye, this was an unreliable test. We had high fixation losses, but the pattern of visual field loss matched very closely with the referring doctor's visual field that they sent over. And this patient has this early nasal partial arcuate, maybe a little bit skewed inferior more than superior, but matches pretty closely to what we saw on the OCT. So structure kind of matches function here for this patient. 
And so the next test we looked at was corneal hysteresis. Corneal hysteresis is a measurement of the corneal biomechanics. I think of hysteresis as the shock absorbing properties of our patient's cornea. 10.5 is the average corneal hysteresis in the American population. And so we can see that this patient has a low corneal hysteresis, 6.3 in the left eye and 8.1 in the right eye. A low corneal hysteresis is a risk factor for glaucoma and glaucoma progression. And the theory here is if we have a low corneal hysteresis, we have poor shock absorbing properties on the cornea, poor shock absorbing properties on the sclera, which translates to the optic nerve at the level of the lamina cabrosa. This is an eye that can't absorb changes in pressure or shock well, and we're going to get bowing back or cupping of that optic nerve. Conversely, a high corneal hysteresis, we have good shock absorbing properties on the cornea, sclera, optic nerve. This is an eye that can absorb changes in pressure well. There's a study by Susanna et al. that looked at glaucoma suspects and their risk of going from glaucoma suspect to glaucoma. And the study concluded that for every one millimeter of mercury lowering in corneal hysteresis, it increased the risk by 21% of moving from, again, suspect to glaucoma. If we're looking at glaucoma patients, a study by Madero et al. said for every one millimeter mercury lower the corneal hysteresis, the visual field index progressed 0.25% faster per year for these patients. And so what's the plan? We diagnosed this patient with visually significant cataracts in both eyes. We said that the right eye is a high risk glaucoma suspect eye and in the left eye we have mild POEG. And so for the right eye, we plan to do FACO only. Remember, cataract surgery alone lowers IOP 2 to probably 5 millimeters of mercury, depending on the baseline pressure. Getting out that cystic lens is going to open up more space for the anatomical drain in the eye to have aqueous exit out. On the left eye, this is a great MIGS patient here. We have a visually significant cataract. And so we decided to do eye stent inject or two trabecular mesh work bypass stents in this left eye. And so let's introduce our first minimally invasive glaucoma surgery device with eye stent inject W or G2. This is a titanium trabecular meshwork bypass stent. This is the smallest implantable device that goes into the human body. The goal of the eye stent is to try to help the body's natural aqueous outflow pathway work better. We're trying to help this patient's drain work better by getting fluid from the anterior chamber into Schlem's canal by bypassing the juxtacanalicular tissue and the trabecular meshwork. Two keys with the surgery here for eye stent inject, this is done with a gonio prism and the surgeon takes a very straightforward approach and it's kind of like pushing a thumbtack into a cork board. The injector pushes these stents into the trabecular meshwork. The second key to know is that the injector comes preloaded with two stents and the standard of care is to put two stents, hopefully about two to three clock hours apart. Eye stent inject is on label and approved to be done in a patient with mild to moderate open angle glaucoma in conjunction with cataract surgery in a patient taking at least one topical glaucoma drop. And when you look at the stent here, the anatomy of the stent, we have the head of the stent, which resides in Schlem's canal. It has four outlets for aqueous outflow into the canal. We have the thorax or the neck, which resides in the trabecular mesh where it kind of holds that stent in place so it doesn't get dislodged. And then the flange, which is viewable in the anterior chamber. And you can see the gonioscopy view here. You're looking at the flange on these gonioscopy pictures. This is the surgery here. The cataract surgery has already been completed in this patient. And so a gonioprism is on the eye. This is working through the same main incision that was used for cataract surgery. Surgeon's going to find the trabecular meshwork and then inject that stent. A little bit of blood refluxes back here. Two to three clock hours over, they'll place that second stent. And so let's look at some data. This is the pivotal trial for FDA approval of eye stent inject in the U.S. It's a two-year study. Over 500 patients were randomized three to one, cataract surgery plus eye stent inject versus cataract surgery alone. On the left bar graph, you're looking at a greater than or equal to 20% reduction in unmedicated diurnal IOP. This is a really big benchmark that the FDA uses, whether it's a new drop, a new laser, or a new glaucoma surgery, to approve one of these new treatments. And so with eye stent inject, over 75% of patients achieved a greater than or equal to 20% reduction in their IOP compared to about 60% in the FACO alone group. On the right, for the absolute IOP lowering, it was seven millimeters of mercury in the combined group compared to about five and a half millimeters of mercury in the cataract only group. 
In this study, 84% of patients were medication-free approaching two years post-operative. And so that's kind of the IOP lowering. It lowered the medication burden in patients as well. But one of the big secondary endpoints for me is safety. In this study, they found that cataract surgery plus eye stent inject was nearly just as safe as cataract surgery alone, and the visual acuity and visual potential were just as good, maybe even a little bit better. And so that's a big key for me is talking about safety in these minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries. And so how did we decide our plan? How did we get there to make this treatment recommendation or surgery recommendation for this patient? And this is kind of how I work through it. First age, are we dealing with a 35 year old patient where we maybe have 40 to 45 years of managing their glaucoma still where we're gonna need multiple treatment approaches or are we dealing with a 75 year old patient where we have mild glaucoma here, maybe moderate glaucoma, we wanna take a safe approach for this patient. Glaucoma is probably not going to cause blindness in this patient. And so we want to try to treat the medication burden and some other uh, concerns as well. Second is, what's the status of the lens? Do we have a clear lens versus a cataract versus a pseudophagic patient? In a patient with glaucoma and a clear lens, I almost think of it as bridging the treatment until we get to cataract surgery plus MIGS. In a patient who's pseudophagic, maybe we reduced their medication burden, and now we're thinking about adding drops back. What is the corneal hysteresis? We said that low corneal hysteresis has proven to be a risk factor for diagnosing glaucoma or the risk of glaucoma, as well as progression in glaucoma. And so we really want to know patients with a low corneal hysteresis, we're maybe going to treat a little bit more aggressively. What is the disease severity and what's kind of the baseline IOP? Different treatments work better. As we all know, low pressure glaucoma is a little bit harder to treat. And if I have a baseline unmedicated pressure of 15, trabecular meshwork stenting is probably not going to be my first treatment approach for these patients. This is maybe a patient where we're going to do something in Schlem's canal or maybe even a subconj procedure, depending on the severity, if you see that visual field like is shown on the left eye on the bottom. And then what's the ocular perfusion pressure? This is mostly mathematical modeling for now, but can we use blood flow to the optic nerve to direct our treatment approach? Can we change blood pressure medications for a patient? And so let's go to our second patient. Patient DW is a 64-year-old Caucasian female who presents for a glaucoma and cataract evaluation. She's had blurred vision for about six months, 2040 in both eyes, but brightness acuity test to less than 2400. Applination tonometry is quite good today. 13 in the right eye, 15 in the left, but her T-max is in the high 20s. And now we have a thin corneal pachymetry, less than 500 microns in both eyes with an afferent pupillary defect in the left eye. DW has had SLT in her left eye only, and she's taking Lumigan just once a day in both eyes. Looking at our diagnostic testing for glaucoma here, first optic nerve head OCT on the right eye. It's easy to get distracted by a definite epiretinal membrane with vitreomacular traction, but if we're just looking at the retinal nerve fiber layer scan in the bottom left, maybe some borderline nasal changes, but I think this is a pretty normal RNFL scan for that right eye. Definitely not advanced disease, maybe early. On the left eye, we definitely see retinal nerve fiber layer, superior and inferior loss, as well as ganglion cell loss with that central loss of retinal nerve fiber and ganglion cells. If you look at the asymmetry box on the bottom right, we see superior and inferior. Remember, glaucoma is a very asymmetric disease. Once you start to see a bigger difference between superior and inferior, tends to be more advancing disease here. And so that left eye, definitely more retinal nerve fiber layer ganglion cell loss. Comparing now structure to function, visual field on the right side, I said this was a reliable test with maybe an early superior partial arcuate defect versus just some scatter. As you'll see in the coming slides, patient DW has a pretty advanced cataract in both the right eye and the left. And this is why if you look at the bottom at your total deviation, you see a pretty advanced visual field loss. And if you look at pattern deviation, it looks pretty clear. Remember that total deviation doesn't take into account media and lens opacities as well as pupil size, pattern deviation does. So this was most likely the cataract in that right eye. On the left eye, we have definite severe visual field loss with a superior nasal greater than inferior nasal arcuate defect that is encroaching onto the central visual acuity. And so whether you use HODAP parish grading or use the American Glaucoma Society grading, this is severe visual field loss in this left eye. Going to our slit lamp exam here on the left, you see a Krukenberg spindle or pigment on the corneal endothelium. 
As iris pigmentation gets released, the convectional flow of aqueous brings that pigment from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber and it deposits on the endothelium. On the right side, we see flaking of the anterior lens capsule, that classic kind of bullseye pseudoexfoliation appearance on that lens. This is a patient with pseudoexfoliation glaucoma. When we have the rubbing of the posterior iris onto the anterior lens, we get this white fibrillar material that's released. On gonioscopy, we see a highly pigmented trabecular meshwork. And so this is a patient with pseudoexfoliation glaucoma. We said it was mild in the right eye. In the right eye, our plan was to do cataract surgery plus a micro stent being hydrous. And on the left eye, our plan is to do cataract surgery plus canaloplasty plus trabeculotomy, which is omni. Again, important to remember that cataract surgery alone lowers IOP, but probably maybe even more important in patients with pseudoexfoliation, getting the lens out takes out a whole bunch of that pseudoexfoliation material and I think lessens the risk long-term. Remember though, right after cataract surgery in patients with pseudoexfoliation syndrome and glaucoma, we're gonna stir up a whole bunch of that material. So we worry about post-operative IOP spikes, but it's definitely a good thing long-term. And so let's look at our second MIGS device here with Hydrus. This device provides a trabecular meshwork bypass and then dilates and scaffolds Schlem's canal. It opens it up. I think of Hydrus as kind of putting the trabecular meshwork in Schlem's canal on stretch. This is the biggest MIGS stent currently available by the FDA. It's about eight millimeters in length. It's the size of an eyelash and it spans three clock hours. You're looking at the surgery here. Right now, the surgeon is just starting to get the insertion, and you're going to see that stent slide forward into trabecular meshwork, again, kind of stretching out Schlem's canal. This is FDA approved to be done in conjunction with cataract surgery, again, similar to eye stent inject. You can see the small little windows or inlets. You can see the end of the stent, which you will see on gonioscopy in the anterior chamber, kind of pointing almost towards you. This is the HORIZON trial. This is three-year data published in ophthalmology on Hydrus. And so this is in print out to three years. It's been updated at the American Glaucoma Society meeting for four and five-year data as well. But specifically for the 36-month data, this is 556 patients with cataract surgery and glaucoma, randomized two to one, cataract surgery plus Hydrus versus FACO alone. On the left shows up again, there's that lowering of IOP greater than or equal to 20%. It was statistically significant being greater in the combined hydrus plus cataract surgery group compared to cataract surgery alone. You can see a pretty robust IOP lowering in both groups, 8.8 .8 millimeters in the combined group compared to 8.5 millimeters of mercury in the cataract surgery alone group. A big key to the study was the baseline unmedicated IOP before surgery was high. It was above 25, and so we expect to see a greater reduction there. On the right, patients who are medication-free at three years, almost 75% of the combined group compared to less than 50% of the patients who had cataract surgery alone. From AGS, the four-year data said that still 65% of patients who had cataract surgery plus hydrus are medication-free. One of the concerns with having more inlets for aqueous outflow is we can get some peripheral anterior sneaky. This was 13% into, into the stent itself, and 5% of these were obstructive with hydrus, and that's again from the horizon data. In DW's left eye, we plan to do canaloplasty plus trabeculotomy or omni. In the surgery here, again, a gonioprism on the eye, you're going to see a blue microcatheter. So step number one, the surgeon makes a small opening or unroofs just a little bit of the trabecular meshwork. He or she is going to push this microcatheter through Schlem's canal. It goes 180 degrees at a time. They're going to draw back the microcatheter, and then they're going to push the wheel forward again. And pushing it forward that second time is going to force in a thick, viscoelastic material to kind of pump up, dilate Schlem's canal to get more of that aqueous, more opening to get to the collector channels. One of the nice keys with Omni is this can be very titratable. You can do a 180 degree canaloplasty, you can do a 360 degree canaloplasty, and then the second step, which you'll see here in just a second, is the trabeculotomy, the unroofing of the trabecular meshwork, and that's what you're gonna see right here. So you're kind of ripping that TM out. In our practice, our kind of standard go-to is to do a 360 degree canaloplasty and 180 degree trabeculotomy. Omni does a really great job for IOP lowering and is really one of my go-tos for more severe glaucoma patients. This works great in pseudophagic patients 
as well. One of the bigger post-op concerns to know is we can have some iatrogenic or surgery caused hyphema in these patients. The surgeon's working in a vascularized space and in my experience, about 15% of patients will have a little bit of blood in the anterior chamber on post-op day one, lessening at post-op day week. And this is mostly just patient education here. We've shown some numeric data here, but let's look at some histological data or evidence of canaloplasty working. And so this is standalone viscodilation. On the left histology slide, this is a patient you were looking at the trabecular meshwork. Schlem's canal here is what's circled. And you can see how the canal is really compressed here. There's not a lot of area for fluid to flow out. There's minimally spacing. On the right post viscodilation, you can see how much more opened the Schlem's canal is. There's more room here for the collector channels to pick up aqueous and really work. Another option for really either of DW's eyes would have been a goniotomy. We can do that with either Cook dual blade, which is a surgical device that kind of lifts and excises out the trabecular meshwork. Trabectome uses plasma energy to kind of destruct or ablate the trabecular meshwork. Both of these could have been good options for this patient as well. Both of them fall into goniotomy procedures, so unroofing or removing the trabecular meshwork. A big key here is we are altering the anatomy and physiology of the angle. And so once you kind of destruct that procedure, you really can't go back and stent it. And so that's an important thing to know. We usually do cook dual blade in our practice about three to four clock hours. And so we still have other areas of the angle to work. You can see the bright white arrows pointing on gonioscopy to the area where the surgery was performed in a patient who has a goniotomy. Hopefully afterwards, you'll see kind of a bright white scleral spur band, and that's because the TM has been removed. And so let's check back in on our patient DW here. This is a line graph of DW's IOP. Preoperatively, we were 15 in the left eye, 13 in the right eye on Lumigan once a day in both eyes. You can see at one week, the eye pressure is pretty stable at 13. I must have been feeling bullish or aggressive this day. I decided to remove the Lumigan at one week, which is earlier than I usually remove glaucoma medications in an angle-based procedure. And sure enough, a week later, the patient comes back. She has a frontal headache. Eye pressure spikes up to 36 and 28. This is most likely now a steroid-induced IOP spike. And so what we did is we took her prednisolone acetate down to just once a day for a week, got her back on her Lumigan, and you can see the eye pressure responded nicely. A week later, 16 and 12, we get her off her steroid at that point, and now three and six months later, we've reduced the eye pressure three to four millimeters of mercury. DW is still on Lumigan just once a day in both eyes. And so how do we manage these patients in the post-operative period? What does it entail? The goal of MIGS post-operative care and MIGS in general is to be pretty similar to cataract surgery. And so when I'm seeing these patients, I'm most commonly seeing them at one day, one week, one month, and three months. Probably 80 to 90% of the MIGS surgeries that we do in our practice are co-managed by the referring optometrist. I think this is something that's definitely should be in our armamentarium of care. We change, though, the post-operative schedule really based on IOP and visual acuity. Glaucoma severity can change that as well. But for the continued monitoring for IOP, we can have some immediate IOP spikes. This could be if it's in the first 24 to 48 hours, retained viscoelastic material. We can add aqueous suppressants here or burp the paracentesis. The eye pressure is going to fluctuate early, and a lot of that is dependent on steroid. For the slit lamp exam, we can have some normal inflammation in the chamber, can have some hyphema afterwards. If we do, we just want to make sure that that's going away over time. Gonioscopy, I would recommend doing gonio at least one time in the global period. You want to be able to view the area where surgery was performed. And then I'm getting new baseline OCT Humphrey visual field about three to six months postoperatively, depending on glaucoma severity. One of the most asked questions I get from colleagues or residents is, how do I manage the medications? How do I add or remove titrate the medications in a patient who's had either cataract surgery plus MIGS or MIGS alone in a pseudophagic patient? And so in the immediate post-operative period, here's how I kind of think of this, but every patient's different. For trabecular meshwork, Schlem's canal-based procedures, I'm cautious with removing medications too quickly. At the one day, one week, I'm usually not removing medications and then thinking more about it at one and three months post-operatively. When we still have steroid on the eye, we're a little bit more prone to having some IOP spikes and fluctuations in these patients who have trabecular meshwork, Schlem's canal-based 
procedures. For procedures that are supracoroidal space, which we don't have any right now, but these patients, I'm a little bit more aggressive at removing the medication, steroids a little bit less of a concern. And then for subconj procedures, tubes, trabs, in focus, micro shunt, which is coming, I'm aggressively getting the glaucoma medications off. I want there to be some aqueous pushing through that device. These are bleb-based procedures, and so I want that bleb to be elevated and kind of be forced open. The ultimate point here, though, is we're still managing glaucoma. That's really what it is at the roots. And so let the OCT and visual field dictate. The eye pressure is, of course, a piece to that puzzle. But if you have a visual field that looks like this on the left, preoperatively, you repeat it three or six months postoperatively, and it looks just the same, but the eye pressure only went from 20 to 18, I think it's very reasonable to try to remove a medication. We have stable glaucoma, and removing that medication, this patient may do just fine. Conversely, if we have a visual field that looks like this on the left, and it progresses to what you see on the right, even if we have an eye pressure of 14 in three or six months, if we see that type of visual field progression, we have to be more aggressive. We're not removing meds, we're maybe adding meds for this patient. And so let's go to our last case here. Patient JH is a 72-year-old Caucasian male who presents for a glaucoma evaluation. In his kind of history, he says, my right eye pressure is out of control. I've had cataract surgery many years ago in both eyes, and he's taking a teal cap once a day and a blue cap twice a day in his right eye only, the teal caps in both eyes. And so think of how many of your glaucoma patients know their drops based on cap color. One of the telltale signs for me of a patient who's not taking their glaucoma drops is if they don't know the cap color, they're definitely not looking at that bottle once a day or twice a day. Best corrected visual acuity for JH, 2030 in the right eye, 2025 in the left eye, gonioscopy is open in all angles. Applination tonometry is now elevated. 31 in the right eye, 16 in the left. We have a pachymetry of 525 in both eyes, which is borderline thin, and a low corneal hysteresis. Lower in the right eye at 8.2 than the left eye at 9.9. .9. And he does have an afferent pupillary defect in the right eye. If you look at the optic nerve photo on the right, we see a faint Drantz hemorrhage inferior. And so this is a patient that raises my suspicion level, raises red flags to me that this is not only a patient with glaucoma, but a patient with something changing in their glaucoma. And so I'm maybe going to be a little bit more aggressive with this patient. In JH's left eye, he had a mild partial arcuate defect that has been stable for many years. And so we're going to focus on just his right eye. On the left, you see the hood printout for OCT, looking at ganglion cell analysis, as well as retinal nerve fiber layer. And then on the right, you see his 24-2 Humphrey visual field. First on the left, looking at the RNFL curve shown on the left, you can see we have pretty aggressive inferior retinal nerve fiber layer thinning. If you go to the retina view, superior and inferior retina, boy, we see quite a bit of loss to the retinal nerve fiber layer on that inferior portion. This translates to the ganglion cell analysis, which then gives us an idea of what we expect to see on visual field. If you look at that 10-2 visual field, estimation on the superior retina, we see more of that loss there. This then corresponds to the 24-2 visual field where we see a severe superior arcuate defect, definitely again affecting central vision. We have that inferior nasal arcuate as well and severe visual field loss on this right eye. And so for JH, because of his severe visual field loss, his high interocular pressure on three medications, we have this Drance hemorrhage, and he's also pseudophagic, we chose to do a subconjunctival approach with Zengel Stent. This is a six millimeter hydrophilic device that is connecting the anterior chamber to the subconjunctival space. This is a bleb-based procedure. You're watching a video here, but the procedure in summary is really the surgeon's making a controlled sclerotomy or a controlled hole in the sclera. Inside that hole, the surgeon's going to place a small straw. That straw is then connecting the anterior chamber to the subconscious space or a bleb like a balloon that raises up. And inside the straw, the surgeon places a noodle. The noodle inside the straw will start to expand. As aqueous starts to flow past it, that is a safety mechanism so that all the eye pressure doesn't run out at once and tries to have a more controlled aqueous outflow. You're looking at the needle pass here. Ganeo prism is going to go on the eye.
you'll see as he withdraws the needle here, you'll see kind of a neon yellow stent that's left behind. Once inserted and after the procedure, the goal is to have one millimeter of the Zen gel stent in the anterior chamber, three millimeters in the intrascleral space, and two millimeters in the subconj space. At the very beginning and now at the end, you'll see some mitomycin C, which is an anti-scarring medication to try to stop scarring of the bleb. And we also can do bleb needling or kind of break that scarring back open for these patients, which we'll talk more about. This is a prospective study. This was the U.S. pivotal clinical trial for Zen. It was 65 patients in a standalone fashion. So Zen was done alone. It was not combined with cataract surgery in the U.S. pivotal trial. In this study, patients were mostly primary open angle glaucoma, and many of them had other previous glaucoma surgeries, which included cataract surgery, SLT. It also included some incisional glaucoma surgery patients. A big key with this pivotal trial is this is more advanced glaucoma. Medicated IOP of 25 on 3.5, or what I would consider maximum medication therapy. The mean or average mean deviation for visual field in this clinical trial was minus 15. So again, more advanced, more aggressive glaucoma in this pivotal trial. In the trial, 12 months after Zen gel placement, IOP dropped about 10 millimeters of mercury from 25 down to 15.9, and medications were cut in half from 3.5 to 1.7. A big key from the trial, over 75% of patients achieved that benchmark of greater than or equal to 20% reduction in their medicated baseline at 12 months. Still from the U.S. pivotal trial, this is now looking at the post-operative adverse events. First with hypotony. I always tell patients it's hard to get a high eye pressure to come down. It's even harder to get a low eye pressure to come up. Hypotony in these patients can be very destructive to the visual acuity as well as the eye health as a whole. Hypotony in the FDA clinical trial was about 25% of patients after Zen had hypotony. They used an eye pressure of less than or equal to six here. I think of numeric hypotony where patients sometimes will do just fine of about four, five, six. Zero, one, two, three is where we have more choroidals and the eye starts to kind of compress on itself. In my experience with Zen, we're not having one out of four patients have hypotony in the early post-operative period. It's a little bit less. Patients are doing quite well. And then second is bleb needling. We talked about that the bleb can kind of scar down. It can almost get an eggshell on the inside of the bleb where we're getting fluid into the bleb. It just gets stuck there and we'll do a procedure called bleb needling where the surgeon goes in and kind of breaks up some of that scarring, may use mitomycin C to help with this. One out of three patients in the pivotal trial needed bleb needling. It's higher in our practice. It's probably closer to 50% of patients between one to six months will need one bleb needling. We'll sometimes do it a second time. And so a recap for Zen, this is a bigger gun or a bigger procedure here. This does have more risk than some of our trabecular meshwork bypass stents, but it has more potential or, or a larger potential for lowering the interocular pressure. Our angle-based procedures, maybe like an Omni plus using medications afterwards, could have definitely been a consideration for JH. I think that would have been a, a great approach as well. We chose to go a little bit more aggressive to try to get a bigger response in eye pressure and medication lowering for this patient. And so for the post-operative management of MIGS, what do you need to know? When you're seeing these patients back in your clinic, what are some of the keys here? First, paramount in MIGS is safety. Safety, Mon. We want to have safe procedures, but here's five of the most common adverse events post-operatively. First, IOP spikes. Again, we talked about, I, I want to understand what's causing the eye pressure spike. If it's in the first 24 to 48 hours, it's most likely retained viscoelastic material. If it's three, seven, 25 days postoperatively, now it's most likely going to be steroid. And we can alter the topical steroid if a patient's using the steroid topically. If it's interocular steroid or the surgeon injects steroid, well, then we have to be able to manage this a little bit more, usually with just medications. Remember, steroid is going to clog the trabecular meshwork and the conventional outflow pathway. And so you see more steroid responsiveness in patients who have angle-based MIGs. Our second adverse event is a microhyphema blood coming back in to the front part of the eye. You're going to see this more with superciliary devices, more with angle-based procedures where we're cutting or removing tissue here. And so KDB, goniotomy is a bigger one here. You can see this with canaloplasty. And then again, our supercroidal devices. Hypotony, can it happen? 
this is really the eye pressure going too low. A big key here is if you're working through conventional outflow through the angle, so trabecular meshwork, Schlem's canal, if the procedure is done correctly, you really shouldn't have an eye pressure below episcleral venous pressure of 8 to 11 millimeters of mercury. If you have a supracoidal device, you can see some big fluctuations in pressure and then subconj procedures, incisional glaucoma procedures, we can have the eye pressure go too low because we don't have the goalie to keep it from going below episcleral venous pressure, which is EVP. Endothelial cell loss, only supracoidal devices have had endothelial cell loss greater than 10% from baseline, but this is a key. This is why CyPass was first voluntarily recalled by Alcon and then second by the FDA was because of endothelial cell loss in patients who had under-implanted CyPass stents. And that's a big key here, but this has really shown a bright light on endothelial cell loss in MIGS. And so that will be something that's continued to be tracked. Uh, we did about 100 CyPass stents in our practice. I think we've trimmed two or three, but we haven't had to remove any, and we haven't had a patient who went on to endothelial failure because of it. And then peripheral anterior sneakia, the iris getting pulled up almost into the stent. Remember from the pivotal trials, hydrus 13% of patients, eye stent inject is 6% in that clinical trial. You can use a YAG laser to kind of do a little laser and open these back up. And so we've talked through a lot of procedures and we have really good options. MIGS is almost becoming a buffet line where you can walk down and pick and choose. We can also combine some of these procedures where we're doing a procedure that helps aqueous outflow and maybe turns down aqueous production. We can first do a trabecular meshwork procedure and maybe come back later if needed and do something subconj or more aggressively in the angle. And so how do you decide? How do you make a targeted referral to the surgeon that you work with on, on what MIGS procedure you want, what's kind of the algorithm here. And so this is how I decide. This is ever evolving. And a lot of this is courtesy of Tom Samuelson, one of my mentors. But first, what's the status of the lens? We make different decisions based on a patient if we're going to do it in conjunction with cataract surgery or a pseudophagic patient. Sometimes we'll do MIGS in patients who are phagic and don't have a visually significant cataract. So all that comes into play. But we want to maximize safety. We want to maximize a quick visual recovery. We want to take less risk. I think working in trabecular meshwork in the canal makes sense here. When we need to take greater efficacy, we're willing to take a little bit more risk, but we want a better safety profile than tubes and trabs. I think this is super choroidal and super ciliary devices, although we don't have one available right now. If we have quick progressing glaucoma, we have secondary glaucomas like neovascular or uveitic glaucoma, or we have a need for a real low IOP, this is where transscleral devices like Zen, tubes, and trabs come into play for me. And so I want to say thank you guys for joining. I hope you have a great rest of your meeting. Thanks to Eyes on Glaucoma for inviting me. I did put my email down at the bottom here. And if you have questions that we don't answer live, or you have some questions that come up a week down the road, or you have a concern, please reach out to me. I'd love to connect. If there's anything that I can help with, please don't hesitate. I consider you all colleagues and friends. And again, have a great rest of your meeting. Wow, Mitch, great lecture. Uh, you know, you're such an expert in the MIGS arena. I just really appreciate you taking the time to be at this meeting, sharing your knowledge with us. You know, you and I work alongside each other. So conversations like what you just talked about happen every day in our clinic. And uh, it's a lot of fun to have you here. So thanks for taking the time and being here. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a great lecture. Thanks to everyone who attended so I'm going to throw a few questions at you. We got about five minutes or so. And so the first question I want to ask you is, we know that cataract surgery alone lowers intraocular pressure. We know from a variety of different studies that it does that. And you made a case for MIGS and, and how it works and how it lowers intraocular pressure. So why, since, why would we want to implement MIGS when, when cataract surgery alone already lowers pressure anyways? What's the point? If it's a patient that has moderate or severe glaucoma, I get it. But what about those patients that have mild glaucoma, what's the point of a MIGS? Yeah, think about the lens as kind of a growing cyst inside the eye. It's taking up space and the drainage and the outflow system works less efficiently. There's a great study that looks at cataract surgery alone for lowering eye pressure compared to cataract surgery plus MIGS. And in both studies, the eye pressure was lowered. They took the, this study though one step further and they looked at visual field loss and OCT change 
And in the patients who had cataract surgery alone, despite having lowering of the interocular pressure, they still progressed on ancillary glaucoma tests. And so I think of cataract surgery plus MIGS, the time of taking the cataract out is really a timestamp in that patient's life to treat the glaucoma as well. And even though cataract surgery lowers IOP, those patients still progressed. What about patients, I'll back up. We know that glaucoma is a lifelong disease. It's not something that, you know, yes, yeah, start a treatment like a topical glaucoma medication. And then after we do that, they're cured for the rest of their lives. It's more like a marathon. I'm a runner, I think about races. So I think of it like a marathon, not like a sprint. What about patients that undergo a MIGS procedure? Is a MIGS procedure something that once it's done is going to fix the problem or are there other steps that we have to consider after a MIGS procedure has been done? And what can be hey, done? Great, great question. Glaucoma fights back. And so we talked about kind of our philosophy of trying to work in the trabecular meshwork Schlem's canal first, trying to work in the angle. And if we stent the trabecular meshwork first, we still can go deeper into Schlem's canal. We can add endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation, so we can try to turn down the phosphor pump that makes fluid, and we still save the subconjure transscleral space. And so MIGS can definitely be built on. You, I think of it kind of as a sink. You're just working farther down in that conventional outflow pathway, or trying to turn down aqueous production, or finally kind of bypassing the patient's natural outflow system. And so I think of the average minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, we're trying to buy five to 10 years of non-progressive glaucoma, before we're kind of coming back to the drawing board. It won't most likely be one thing that takes care of glaucoma forever. So we asked a poll question in your lecture, you know, how many of the attendees, our colleagues that are on this uh, lecture are co-managing MIGS procedures? And interestingly enough, 100% at this point in time are co-managing MIGS, which is really an impressive number and actually makes yeah. me really happy. What yeah. advice would you have to our colleagues? These are already doing it, but what can the people that are on this call with us on this lecture, how can they educate our colleagues that are maybe not co-managing MIGS? What's a good way to get started? Yeah, I think the goal of minimally invasive glaucoma surgery when it's with cataract surgery is to have post-operative care vision very similar to cataract surgery alone. And so I think you can approach it with the same follow-up schedule with some of the same skills. You're just managing a patient with glaucoma still. In a patient, whether it's cataract surgery plus MIGS or MIGS in a pseudophagic patient, being comfortable and confident with gonioscopy, being able to view the angle, the area that was worked on, I think is a huge thing and, and really one of the foundation blocks for taking care of these patients pre and post operatively. And one last question, then I'm gonna let you go. You had talked a little bit about some post operative considerations and something that you know I see a lot when I'm managing MIGS patients is, and it doesn't matter if it's a stent or, or a goniotomy, whatever it may be, I see some blood inside the eye at times. And that can be a scary thing for patients. How do you handle that? What's your, what's your recommendation on how to handle that when we have hyphemas or microhyphemas in patients with MIGS? Remember the surgeon is stenting, cutting, or dilating into a vascularized space. And so when we do the surgery in the angle, we're connecting the anterior chamber angle to episcleral venous pressure, which has blood in it and can push back. And so I kind of take a utopic view. If we have some blood in front of the eye, we've connected those two areas but this is mostly a patient education point. This blood's gonna go away on its own, the body will resorb it. It's almost always non-visually significant for our patients. If it lingers though longer than the one to two week post-op visit, then we're maybe thinking we have to go in there and wash it out. But that is few and far between, probably three cases in the last five to seven years for me. Great. Well, again, I appreciate your time today. Uh, again, great lecture. And, you know, I love working alongside you and it's yeah. even more fun doing these types of things with you as well. So have a great day and, and appreciate you uh, giving your time to us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to Eyes on Glaucoma for inviting me. Have a great meeting, everyone.